everyone, I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to the Happiness Hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire, and create. Every week, a new speaker joins us to share a bit of inspiration, creativity, and their photography expertise. Upcoming presentations can be found on my website at lindanickel.com. Under Happiness Hour, you'll find the links to my YouTube channel and our community blog. Erin Randall is a coach and motivational speaker who has survived putting up with me for all 50 sessions of the Happiness Hour. You can find her at admiliorracoaching.com. So say hello, Erin. Hello. And I didn't we miss like one session together? You know, as soon as I said 50, I thought, I think. I think there was one where like something happened and it was like uh -huh. I was someplace, but yeah. But you know, you pretty much have to talk to me. But I'm in at 49 regardless. Yeah. So. No, okay. We'll give you that. Um, so I'm happy to, to see that you've stuck around. <laughs> so, all right, Sherry Hunt is our guest tonight. Sherry is an astrophotographer based in Dallas, but allows her wanderlust to lead her to the darkest skies in the United States. As a photography guide and workshop instructor, Sherry is intimately familiar with West Texas, and you can join her on one of her workshops through her website, bigbennightphotography.com. Sherry was here last summer, and her class, Milky Way Hunting for Beginners, can be found on the YouTube channel. And in tonight's presentation, Creating Star Trails, Sherry will teach you how to make star trails with one image or by stacking multiple images in post-processing. She will discuss cameras and intervalometer settings, the effect of different lenses and focal lengths, and post-processing using Lightroom and Workshop. So welcome back, Sherry. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Welcome so, back. Okay. And I'm glad that um, I think all of our technology is going to work just fine. We both have had some weird stuff going on the last, I don't know, 24 hours. So yeah. if, if it doesn't, y'all just hang tight and we'll, we'll come back. All right, okay. Sharon, I'm going to turn it over to you. Why don't you, um, I kind of glossed over and I just kind of said, you know, this is what you do. Tell us a little bit about um, how you got started and maybe fill in the gaps of something that I might have missed that sure. you'd like to share. No worries. Um, so I am in Dallas now. Um, I moved, I grew up in Texas actually, went to A&M and left Texas as soon as I graduated from college and I moved up to the Pacific Northwest. And I lived up there for about 10 years and I've always had a camera in my hand, um, but it's always kind of been a hobby for me. So I am in the medical research field. Um, and right now I'm at UT Southwestern. So I, I have a day job um, and I love my job. Um, I'm actually a training manager. So I teach people how to be a good trainer. And <laughs> so, um, so I, I kind of train people all day and I train trainers. Um, so I really enjoy the aha moments and I enjoy teaching people things. And I think that's why I've taken my passion and I end up, I don't do it full time. It's not my money maker or anything, but I offer a few workshops a year. Um, but I try not to do more than that because I like to get out myself and get the camera in my hand. But um, yeah, I've always been a landscape person um, when I lived in the Northwest, but I never shot the night sky and I did long exposures in the city, but I never, I really frankly never was around um, in the middle of the night in dark skies. So in 2009, um, I happened to be, I had moved back and I happened to be in West Texas with some friends and we were at a ranch and I didn't even have a tripod, but I had this camera that I knew did 30 second exposures. And so I'm not kidding. I put it flat on the driveway thinking, I wonder what I can catch. And it kind of went from there. Um, and I, of course, learned how to focus on all that stuff. But that first picture was a blurry mess. But the fact that I saw a ton of dots and they were like all these different colors just kind of started the addiction. So um, night photography for me is really addicting. Um, I absolutely love it. And I think it's that um, it's, it's seeing what you collect in the back of the camera that our human eyes can't see. And to me, that's the magic. So um, that's kind of how I got, got involved. So. All right, so let me get started. Um, I guess I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Let's see if we can do it. Okay. Can you guys see that? I see it, I do. Right. Awesome. So um, again, I'm gonna really kind of hone in on star trails. Um, 
I kind of consider myself a learner still on star trails on, on all things night photography. I'm constantly learning new techniques and learning better processing. But I want to say that there's a million ways to kind of do star trails. Um, and there's a ton of videos on YouTube to get help. Um, and sometimes that can also be overwhelming, but um, overall just, you know, go to YouTube. But if any of you ever have a question, just reach out, I'm happy to answer. So, um, okay. So just an overview, we're gonna talk about star trails, what in the world, how do we get them? But there's two ways to make them. Um, we can do one long exposure or we could do a stack. And so I'm gonna kind of talk about why would you wanna do one way versus the other? What are benefits versus what are the problems? And then we'll go into camera and um, intervalometer settings. And then we'll talk about how in the world to do it in post-processing. Um, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on post-processing. There's a ton of videos out there, but I'll kind of show you the very bare basics. And then really the fun part is talking about star trail orientation um, in the night sky and composition. So how do you start to get uh, different types of lines in different directions and compose that with different things you wanna shoot? And then finally, there's a couple of really cool techniques that once you get the star trail basic technique down, there's a lot of other fun things you can do. So I'll go over those too. So um, bottom line, star trails is that perceived movement of the stars, um, but really the stars aren't moving, right? So we're spinning around pretty fast, but we're, stay, we're here on earth. So we kind of see what looks like the stars are moving. Um, and I actually accidentally say that all the time, but essentially we're spinning pretty fast. Um, so it's all about shutter speed. And one of the things that I want to point out is the settings that we use for um, like Milky Way photography or when we want pinpoint stars uh, are very different from star trail settings. And so I'll talk about the 500 rule. If you already heard it, you may have heard about it. Sometimes it's the 400 rule depending on your sensor. Um, but essentially, if you want to get pinpoint stars, you're worried about going too long on shutter speed because then the stars start to drag. So in star trails, we can kind of throw that rule out the window because we want the drag, right? So we wanna have those really long lines from the stars. And so um, shutter speed can be anything from, you know, five seconds to hours um, or 30 seconds in, or minutes or hours. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, so the camera settings are a lot different. And the other thing is there's really no set magical setting that I can give anybody. Um, it really depends on what kind of skies you're in. If you're in really, really dark skies versus skies that have light pollution or a lot of ambient light, your settings are gonna be much different. So we'll talk a little bit about how to figure that out, um, but it's not like a magic recipe I can usually give you, so. Okay, so the equipment you need, um, a camera, a tripod, um, basically your shutter trigger. Uh, some people will have a remote or a trigger um, or an intervalometer, and that's usually what I use, and a lot of patients. Um, a lot of patients, but I want to really hone in on that sturdy tripod part. Um, this is a great example of a tripod that got bumped. Um, so this is um, me at Mount Rainier. And if you can see on the mountain here, if you've ever shot Mount Rainier, it's just amazing because you can watch in the summertime, the hikers ascend the mountain. And so this is early in the evening when they're ascending. And so I can kind of get a little bit of that light, but I was trying to get the star trails of the hikers, the stars and the hikers. And um, sure enough, if you bump your tripod, this is what's gonna happen. So a sturdy tripod's really good, especially also if it's pretty windy. I will add that um, the carbon fiber tripods that are out there, while they're a little bit pricier, um, they certainly will help absorb some bumps that might happen. Um, so occasionally that will help, but, um, but you definitely want a sturdy tripod, not anything very light, so, okay. So let's just get to the heart of the matter. There's two ways to make star trails. Um, one way is just one simple long exposure. Um, so the picture on the left is a 10 minute exposure using my um, 200 focal length. So a lot longer focal length of that same mountain, um, trying to hone in on the, there's um, a tent up there or a little hut uh, with a bunch of people and then trying to get those long star trails. So one long exposure for 10 minutes. Um, on the other side is a multiple images. So that's an hour of images each at 30 seconds with a wide angle lens uh, stacked. And so we'll talk about how to do that today. And we'll talk about the differences. So why would I wanna do one long exposure? Um, so what's the benefit? Well, a lot of times we can do minutes, um, not necessarily hours on one long exposure. So it's easy. 
and kind of like my little icon down there, you can usually stand by your tripod and wait around. Um, so it's a lot quicker. Um, the longer focal length, um, if you use a very long focal length, as opposed to like a wide angle lens, you can get some really long trails. If I had taken the same picture with a wide angle lens, well, A, I wouldn't be very close to the mountain at all, but B, those lines wouldn't even be half the size in that amount of time. So the longer your focal length, the longer the star trails. Um, and I'll circle back on focal length on why you usually can't stack um, focal lengths that are over like 80 or 100. Um, and the earth is basically spinning so fast that we'll talk a little bit later about stacking, but um, the longer focal lengths work better for just like that one exposure. So the increased light from a very long, long focal length also is gonna hit the foreground. And so when we're stacking images, often we usually do like a shorter image or a shorter exposure. So we'll stack like hundred images at 30 seconds, but that shorter exposure isn't gonna light up your foreground. So one of the really great things about long exposures, and you can also stack longer exposures, but the great thing about those is all that time will light up the foreground as well. So that's the benefit of doing like longer exposures. And then finally, um, the benefit of like one long exposure is just there's little post-processing other than the basic edit that you're doing to that picture, you're not gonna stack them. So um, I love um, very long one-time exposures. Um, I'll play around. My favorite um, is about 10 to 20 minutes, um, depending on what I have in the foreground. So that's actually my favorite kind of star trail. Um, and usually it takes a couple of times to get it right, but this is an example of one of them. So what are the problems with doing one long exposure and why would you wanna stack? Um, so usually um, you cannot do one long exposure if you have like the moon in the sky, especially if it's um, greater than like a 2% moon. Um, that area of the picture will probably get overexposed. Um, in fact, the whole picture could get overexposed if it's a big moon or like light pollution, um, especially if it's a, a really um, bright light pollution. So you can't do that most likely in a 10 minute exposure. Um, and the other caveat that's real obvious is if um, you're shooting for 10 minutes or 20 minutes and somebody turns on a light or a car drives by, um, and sometimes those are good accidents, but most of the time it ruins the whole picture. And it could be that that doesn't happen until minute 19 in a 20 minute shot. So you've just wasted 19 minutes that somebody kind of ruined. Um, so usually when there's a lot of people nearby, I will switch to stacking as opposed to doing like a 10 or a 20 minute exposure. And then the other thing that's very hard to do in one long exposure, it's really hard to retain the color of the stars. Um, stars are not white. And um, the reason they look white is because we've blown them out uh, because of our exposure or because of post-processing. And so to really retain the color of the stars, um, you wanna do a second uh, or a shorter exposure or bring down your settings quite a bit. And so we'll talk about that too um, in a minute. So, um, Settings for one long exposure, a couple of things to think about. Um, when you're doing settings, you basically want to expose for the current scene. And again, there's not a perfect um, exposure uh, setting that I can give you. It really depends on the ambient light, um, depends on um, light pollution that might be nearby. It even depends on like the amount of dust that's in the atmosphere. All of that can make a huge difference in your um, light and, and the settings in your camera. But once you figure out your settings, um, there's a really cool trick I'll show you in a minute on how to compose and figure out your settings for a shorter exposure, say for like 20 seconds, and then learning how to reset your settings for 20 minutes. Um, so I'll talk about that in a second. But basically during your one long exposure is compose your settings and then put your camera on bulb with a trigger or use an intervalometer. And we'll talk about the intervalometer set settings in a minute. The other thing I tell people is if you're doing just one long exposure, you can turn on long exposure noise reduction on your camera, um, especially if you're in a really um, hot or warm environment. Um, all that heat hitting, working the sensor will also cause a lot of noise. And so turning that on is a benefit to reduce the noise. However, if you are doing like a 10 minute exposure or a 20 minute exposure, what long exposure noise reduction will do is it basically takes the same picture, the same amount of time with the shutter closed. And so if you are taking a 10 minute exposure, your camera is gonna be tied up for another 10 minutes. So if you're patient enough to deal with that, great. 
Um, I don't have the patience for it, um, but if I know I'm in a really hot place, um, so if I'm in Big Ben in the middle of the summer, I usually have my long exposure noise reduction on because it does help reduce the noise in that final image. And finally, so I wanna circle back. So if you compose an image and let's say you've got an image all set up with uh, maybe some high light pollution in the distance like this, and you did a 20 second exposure and now you've decided you wanna do a 20 minute exposure, how do you reconfigure your settings? Well, if you're not a complete math whiz and you really just don't wanna do it in your head, and I know people that can and I refuse to, um, you can actually use PhotoPills and it's pretty handy. So PhotoPills, if you don't know, is an app. It does cost, um, I think 10 bucks still, but I use PhotoPills for almost every single thing I do when I'm planning um, night shots. But ultimately there's a part of the app called exposure. And if you get to that exposure part of the app, all you do, it's so simple, is you can put in your test settings. So when you set up your test shot, you've got your aperture and your time and your ISO. So you set them in. And then in the third column there, just set your calculate to aperture. And what you're gonna do is you're basically gonna now change your equivalent settings to 20 minutes. Um, you're gonna tell it you wanna go for 20 minutes now and what PhotoPills will give you is what your ISO can get changed to and your aperture and your exposure value in order to compensate for that longer exposure. So it's pretty easy to do. And for the most part, PhotoPills is pretty good with that. Occasionally I've had to adjust from there, but it's a really great quick, fast procedure when you're dead tired at 3 a.m. to do, um, which a lot of times that's when I'm doing star trails. So um, it's a really great app to, to help you figure out the new exposure settings. Okay. So that's about one long exposure. And again, those are probably my favorite to do. Um, but let's talk about the stacked images on the right. So why would you wanna do stacked, multiple stacked images? So the benefits are this. Um, I can probably run a camera for like three or four or five hours if I wanted. Um, and um, a lot of times you do have to have more battery or set it up to a tether for to set it up to connect it to a power bank but the benefits are some longer lines that you can do a lot more creativity to. Um, but the other really great thing about doing a stack exposure is um, if somebody turns on a light or a car drives by or something really bad happens to the foreground, um, I can delete that out and I'll show you guys how to do that tonight. Um, and so I usually use this technique when I have other people around. Um, if I go out with a group and I wanna do star trails, basically I'll do a stack. I'll set up my camera and just let it run while I go do other things or shoot with another body. So that's usually how I'll end up doing it. Um, and then finally, um, using the stacking technique, um, you can shoot with light pollution or you can shoot with the moon because we're not gonna add all that light collected together. Um, so you're not gonna get like a blown out shot that you would if you did like a 10 or 20 minute exposure. And then also there's a lot more creativity you can do in post. Um, that's pretty cool and really interesting. And I'll show you some of that in just a second as well. So what are the problems with stacking? Um, a, I would probably say battery life. So um, a lot of times you can get an adapter to your camera to add two batteries, or you can buy a tether system to connect it to a power. Um, for the most part on my Sony, I put two batteries in and it lasts for about three to four hours. On my Canon, I usually have to tether it. So, um, And then that shorter exposure time usually means a lot less light on the foreground. So for example, the photo on the right, um, this was a stacked image um, and my foreground was completely black, um, but I blended this with a blue hour blend. And so this is a composite technically. The tripod never moved, but I took an image that I took um, three hours before and went ahead and blended it together. So that's the kind of downfall. If you don't do a long set of stacked exposures and you do something like 30 seconds, you usually have a pretty dark foreground. And then finally, stacked exposures don't well work well with really, really long focal lengths. And again, like I mentioned earlier, we're spinning so fast that when we stack those pictures together, you're gonna get longer gaps that star stacks, which is a software I'll talk about in a minute, can't fill, or it's gonna be very monotonous to try to fill those gaps in Photoshop. I mean, you can do it, and I know people that have, but usually after you get beyond like 80 millimeters and you get longer, um, you're not gonna be able to stack those very well without seeing the gaps between, between the uh, lines. 
So those are the problems with doing multiple images. So what would the settings be that are different on your camera if you're gonna stack a bunch of multiple images? Um, one of the things I tell people is turn off your automatic white balance. Um, white balance is something that you can totally fix in post, especially for like single images. And um, it's very subjective. But one of the things your camera will do if it's taking, if you're on purpose trying to succession one after another with the purpose of like blending or stacking them, Every time there's a subtle change in the atmosphere, it could be dust, it could be light, it could be water vapor, your camera will actually do these very subtle color changes. And if you look at your camera, like all the exposures, say you take like 200 and you look at them throughout the night, you'll notice that the color of the sky is actually changing throughout the night. And, and that happens naturally, but if you leave your camera on auto white balance, your camera kind of sometimes will do some really funky um, adjustments to adjust to that. So I try to take it off that so I don't have my camera making any of those decisions. Um, when you're stacking photos, if you're gonna stack them in post, you absolutely wanna turn off your long exposure noise reduction. Um, essentially, like I said, your camera's gonna take a whole nother shot for the same amount of time as your shutter speed. And if that's the case, um, your camera won't have one second between each shot. And that's what we need to have when we stack these to try to get rid of the gap that's gonna be between each star trail. So you wanna make sure your linear, as I say, is off. Um, and it's gonna be a lot easier to work with um, an intervalometer when you do these multiple uh, photos back to back. There are a lot of cameras that have built-in intervalometers, but you wanna make sure that your camera will allow you to shoot with one second in between. Um, there are some newer cameras that won't let you actually do that. And so a lot of people um, will get really far out, get to some dark skies and think they have a great intervalometer in their camera and they actually don't. So um, I always like to have an extra intervalometer with me um, in case something happens to my camera and I have to use one without my intervalometer in it. But a good interval intervalometer is not hard to find. And I always say that because um, intervalometers they run from 100 bucks to 20 bucks, and the 20 buck intervalometer will work just fine. Um, the difference is more fancier options or having a remote, but an intervalometer is an intervalometer, so just go buy the $20 one if you don't have one. And again, the other really important setting is having one um, second between each image. You don't want to go more than one second because as we stack in them, we're going to have too many gaps between the trails. So. And then also there's a part of an app or the part of Photopills app actually lets you kind of figure out if you wanted to like have a certain length of lines in your star trails, you can just pop into that part of their app and figure it out. It's a little bit more um, involved, so I didn't want to bring it into tonight, but it's pretty easy to figure out. And there's a bunch of um, videos online on YouTube to figure out how to do that. So, um, but those are kind of the settings you want to think about for um, stacking for star trails. So I kind of wanted to touch base on intervalometer settings and intervalometer is one of those things that until you really get out and really play with it, I don't know how well or much this is gonna really help go over it, but I thought I'd touch on some of the main ideas. When you're setting up your intervalometer to do images, multiple images to stack them later, there's a couple of things you do wanna make sure they're set up or why you might wanna set certain things. So. On the top of your intervalometer, there's usually these four or five um, words. So the first word is called delay. And that's all about um, when you wanna start your whole series of shooting. And it's really helpful if you wanna like fall asleep and let your camera just start two hours into the night. And the reasons I would do that, um, a lot of times the peak hour for our meteor showers is when I wanna be sleeping. So I can actually delay my intervalometer to not start until like 4 a.m. Um, so that's a good reason. And also if you're waiting for the moon. So um, a lot of times I'll set up my camera to run for a period where I'm just totally not even awake. <laughs> so that's the benefit of also doing the star stacks is I don't need to really be right by my camera. I'll just let it run. So that's what delay is for. It's gonna delay the start of your entire series of exposures. Long basically means that if you're gonna like do one giant long exposure, like a 20 minute exposure, what I do is I'll put my camera in bulb and then on the time, I just set the time of my exposure. So I'll set it for 20 minutes and then I'll let it run. 
Um, and I can set that up to do multiple exposures and I'll show you guys how to do that. But if I'm actually setting up my camera to do like multiple exposures, so like let's say I wanna do like a hundred exposures at 10 minutes each, um, I do something a little bit different just for simple sake. I actually take my camera off bulb and then I just set up my camera the settings on the camera and then I um, basically set the long to zero. I hope that was clear. So basically I make sure it's all off bulb and long is at zero. And then I move over to the next setting, which is intervalometer. And that's where I'm gonna set up my intervalometer. And so this is where you tell your intervalometer, you want only one second, sorry, this is for interval, but you want one second between each shot. Um, and so for star stacks, you don't want more than one second. There are a few cameras out there, I've heard of two that actually will now let you shoot less than one second between each shot. Um, but most of the time, most intervalometers will not let you do that. So, um, and the other thing that's a limiting factor is make sure that your memory card is fast enough. Um, occasionally, I have been with people who have a very slow write or read speed. So it's the write speed we're worried about here. Um, and usually like 90, oh shoot, I forget the, I forget the actual words behind it, but usually 90 whatever per second is, is pretty good. But occasionally people will have a really cheap slow memory card and that actually can ruin the intervalometer setting. In other words, your camera won't be able to keep up because it's writing um, speed is way too slow. And then finally in on the intervalometer means the number of shots. So ultimately if, um, if I want to do 100 shots, this is where I put 100. Um, and a lot of times, if you've never used an intervalometer, it will show an infinity symbol or it will show a dash dash, and that means infinity. And so um, I like to keep things simple. So what I end up doing is I just put my interval number in, I put my camera settings on my camera, and my N says infinity. And that's actually the most simple way to set it up. And then all I do is look at my watch. So I either fall asleep and let my batteries run out or I wake up in an hour, or I just sit back and have a drink of my choice and watch the stars. And that's that's kind of the fun thing about it is just letting it stack away in the camera anyway. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about star trail orientation. And this is kind of my favorite part um, when we're setting up compositions with star trails. And without not going into a ton of information about stars, but when you're looking north, we've got our circumpolar star, um, which is the star where it appears all the other stars kind of circulate around, and that's Polaris. And again, that's only in the northern hemisphere. So um, if you're in the southern hemisphere, you actually won't be able to see Polaris. You actually will have another star that's circumpolar. But for us, we've got, or at least I think most people are probably in the northern hemisphere on this call, but most people um, will see the Polaris, and it looks like all the stars kind of dance around Polaris. Um, and then, so on the southern end of our camp compass, forward, um, so here we have Polaris. And if we're looking towards south, we actually don't have that circumpolar star. It's actually gonna be below the horizon for us. It never gets above the horizon. And so we tend to get more of just an arch when we're looking south. And so if you're wanting an arch like above a beautiful tree, then looking south is what you wanna do. But if you wanna get a circle above that tree, then looking north and getting on the south side of that tree is what you'd wanna do. So it's really kind of fun to play with that. So how do we know um, north? Well, or how do we find Polaris? Um, the easiest way to find Polaris is to find the Big Dipper. And then you take the end of that pan, if you will, and you draw a straight line to the brightest star. And that's gonna be Polaris. That's usually pretty easy to do in skies, the border scale three, or, or I'm sorry, border scale probably, um, I don't know, seven or less. So you really can't see that very well in Dallas, but I can see Polaris if I try really hard. It's pretty easy to get outside of a city and then you can see this. However, um, when you're in really dark skies, it's actually really difficult to see. So this is, um, I spent a lot of time down in Big Bend and the picture on the right is actually one frame uh, of the picture on the left. And if I asked you to try to find the Big Dipper and locate Polaris, that would be really hard to do without seeing that star trail. And so I use an app called Sky Guide and it'll help me locate Polaris pretty easy. Um, but like I said, when you get out there, there are so many stars 
it's very hard to find that big dipper and it's also hard to find Polaris with your eye. So um, I use Sky Guide and then I go from there and try to frame from there. And so in this case, I wanted to frame Polaris and the whole circle over um, the road um, off of uh, Dagger Flats there. So then what does east and west look like? Well, um, if I've got the north Polaris on the right and on the left is um, south, um, then clearly we're looking west, right? So if you look right around the equator, that's actually where we're gonna have star trails that are almost straight, like straight up and down. And so if I wanted to have more like up and down star trails, I'm gonna focus or I'm gonna shoot toward the equatorial line, not toward the poles. So this is looking west and likewise, this is looking east. And so again, if I had a little bit of a longer focal length, our star trails at the equatorial line are gonna look more um, up and down. And so that's how you can kind of tell what, which way a person was facing when they took the photo. So just for fun, which direction is this facing? And I know everybody's silenced, so I'll give you a second. So we've got north on the right and south is on the left. So we're facing west. So, um, so it's kind of fun when you look at other people's star trails and figure out which way they were facing if they didn't um, you know, make it backwards and post or anything like that. But, but it's also a really great way to kind of really play with um, composition and the lines that are going to go through your frame. Okay, um, so what are some other things you can do? I'm gonna talk about posts in a minute after I go through my slides and the post-processing, but some of the other really fun things you can do with star trails, um, is you can defocus the stars. In other words, in this particular picture, I was focusing on the trees. And so I wasn't focused to infinity, like I talk a little bit about when you're focusing on the stars at night. And when you do this, your lines are basically gonna get out of focus. But what's really awesome about that is it really brings out the color and it makes those star trails look a lot bigger. So um, if you get out and you're playing around with star trails, um, actually just turn off infinity a little bit and get them out of focus and it makes for some really beautiful color in addition to some bigger lines. Um, and the thing that I try really hard um, to show people is um, the settings for like if you're doing pinpoint stars or, um, or for um, meteors are, are very different than star trails. So um, these two pictures were taken on the same night um, I just moved my camera a bit, but stars are not white. And um, when I see star trails with really, really white stars, um, I often will tell people, you know, bring down your settings quite a bit to retain the color of the stars. Um, and when you do that, you're going to look at the back of that camera while you're out there and you're going to go, no way, this is just not going to happen. There's like nothing there. Um, so the picture on the right is ISO 4000. And again, I was trying to capture meteors in that picture. So I was really cranking my ISO up a little bit and my aperture. The picture on the, um, sorry, that was the left. The picture on the right, I brought down my ISO and I actually cranked up my aperture to like 5.6. Um, and so um, it looks like nothing. And these are both straight out of the camera and not edited. Um, but when I stack them, um, in these case, they're both stacked pictures. Um, you can really see the color in the stars on the right, as opposed to the white, whitish uh, stars on the left. And, and again, these aren't um, edited at all. I just stacked them straight, but I want you to be able to see that your camera is really going to try to fool you. And it, you're going to want to try to up your settings, um, but just trust um, and just, you know, look at it and post. And after you practice this a couple of times, you'll learn to trust yourself. <laughs> because as a night photographer, you get so used to these really high ISO settings that when you're trying to retain the color in the stars, you, it's very hard to trust that really dark back of the camera. So um, it's one thing you really gotta practice with, but you get better with time. Okay, um, the other really fun thing I like to do is what I call faded ends. Um, one of my favorite artists is Lincoln Harrison, and he's out of Australia. That might be New Zealand actually. And he's got um, several techniques. I totally encourage you, if you aren't familiar with him, to check him out. Um, but he is probably the one person that I think makes the most beautiful star trails ever. And he uses a technique where he kind of um, decreases the exposure um, for stacked trails in Photoshop. And it's a really, not too complicated, but um, when he puts together hours and hours of trails, um, 
he will decrease the exposure on the ends and it just looks like a beautiful smooth star trail it just looks beautiful and so um i like to play around with that but i have to give him credit he has some really great tutorials on how to do it and i feel like i'm still kind of learning how to get that technique down but it's pretty fun to do um and i gotta give uh, i gotta say reflections are a lot of fun to work with um with star trails um really trying to play around with the angle of the camera and how much reflection you get um, you can do this while you're stacking. I think this is a, yeah, this is stacked because you can see some of my mistakes and the gaps up in some of the trails there. Um, but reflections are a lot of fun to uh, play around with as well. Um, and the other thing I don't have any um, slides for is basically there's a lot of fun things that you'll see people do. There's like a vortex thing people can do in Photoshop with star trails. There's like a comet thing where you can like make them look like a comet. We'll do that in star stacks in a minute. So there's a lot of other really artistic things you can do with star trails that are quite a bit fun. Okay, so let me kind of show you um, two ways to actually do the post processing on multiple images that we're going to stack um, together and show you how we do that. So star stacks is a software that is actually free or it was free. I think it still is. And um, it's a guy that puts it together. So we ask for donations, but it's really, really pretty easy. And so um, I used to not use star stacks. I've started using it more because um, before a recent upgrade, you could only put JPEGs into star stacks. So um, anything that I wanted to print or uh, make big, I never would put in star stacks. I would wanna use Photoshop, but star stacks is so fun and easy that I, I've got to show you. That's just really easy to do. Photoshop, on the other hand, um, is more laborious. Uh, but before I go to Photoshop, Star Stacks now does take raw photos. And so that's really a really great thing because if you want to move on and take that edit and then move it to like print or have a big copy, you can still create that in raw, which is really good. Okay, so let me um let me go to my programs here. So um, I've got Lightroom pulled up. Now um, I need to preface this with um, something major. Um, I always shoot in raw, 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 raw. I never shoot in JPEG, um, but for purposes of tonight <laughs> and so that my camera doesn't go flying away and make all these crazy noises, um, I have uploaded everything in JPEG. It'll make things a lot faster and I won't see that awesome, wonderful rainbow wheel. Um, just kidding. So. Um, long story short, um, I would never do this in JPEG. Um, so everything that I do in Lightroom and Photoshop is in RAW. But to make things easy, um, I have a selection of um, basically images that I uh, shot. Actually, this was um, just last December for the Geminids. And, and actually in this shot, which is really cool, the zodiacal light was starting to fade. So that's actually the light that you're seeing in the left part of the screen here, along with the winter Milky Way. Um, but I'm going to just use this um, set of images to go ahead and stack. So when I'm in Photoshop, um, if I want to go ahead and do a batch edit, let me show you guys how to do that. Um, let's just say, and this is straight out of the camera, but let's say I'm just going to play around a little bit and brighten my exposure. Just a couple of really quick edits here. I'm going to bring up my vibrance just a bit and bring up my texture just a little bit. Um, and I'm just going to bring contrast up a bit. So Let's just say this is the exposure I like. Um, to do a batch edit, what I wanna do is I wanna take the same edit and make it across all of the pictures I'm gonna stack. So the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna click on that one image, I'm gonna hold down the shift key, shift key, and then I'm gonna click on that last image. So I'm gonna go ahead and click here and it's gonna highlight all those pictures. And so once it does that, what I wanna do is sync that first picture and all the settings I did with the others. So I'm gonna right click anywhere down there. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself. Instead of doing that, I wanna click sync right over here. So when I click sync, I'm gonna have this window come up. I wanna make sure that at least all the changes I did are checked. And in this case, I'm just gonna have them all checked and then I'm gonna click synchronize. And um, again, this was really fast because these are smaller JPEGs. So I basically synced everything. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull all of this into, um, let's do Photoshop first. So in order to do that, I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna edit in. And then I wanna say open as layers in Photoshop. 
So essentially, um, my camera's gone through a little bit faster because these are smaller JPEGs. Um, and so um, I am going to let it finish. And then what we'll do is we'll talk about how do we stack them in Photoshop. I also have one picture in here on purpose where um, there was a light that went on. Somebody opened a car door or turned on a light. So I'm gonna show you how to edit that out before or when we do the stack. So um, hopefully this is almost done. We'll wait one second, hopefully. Sorry, guys. Let's see. Any questions while we wait? I haven't seen any in the uh, chat. I think you're you're good so far. Okay, I think this is almost done. Okay, good, we're done. So um, basically here's my stack. And um, if you're not familiar with Photoshop layers, I'm not really gonna go into a whole lot of detail, but the key was when we opened this in Photoshop, we had to open this in Photoshop as layers. So that's the most important thing. And so you're gonna get your, um, basically your image with all the layers. And so what we wanna do is it's really simple. I'm gonna click on the very first picture and then I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom layer. I'm gonna hold down my shift key and click on the very last picture. And what I'm doing here is I'm highlighting all the pictures. And then I'm gonna come up here, this is our blend mode and I wanna go from normal to lighten. And that's it. Um, that is all I need to do for, and what I'm basically doing is if there's any light in the layers below, it's just bringing all that light to the final layer. So it's just kind of letting all the light seep through. Now, um, I noticed that for some reason it didn't bring in my messed up picture. So I have a backup over here. Let me uh, make sure my messed up picture is showing. So I'm gonna do this again. I'm gonna just highlight all these layers again. Set my blend mode to lighten. Oh good, here's my screw up. Okay, so this is where somebody walked in front of me and turned on a car light or something. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a mask and mask that out. Now, layers and mask in Photoshop is like a whole wonderful world to learn, um, but it can be a little overwhelming. So I wanna try to keep this really, really simple. So what I wanna do is I need to find that one layer that has a screw up, right? So the way to do that is I can start at the top and see that little eye icon. I can unclick all my eyes until basically that little one part goes away. And I know for example, or I know that this is actually my final picture. So long story short, I'm gonna put all these back on, but that's how you would find out which picture has the light. And you can find out other ways. You can look at Lightroom and figure out which one it is. But um, if I'm trying to look here, I would have to sometimes turn on and off all my eyeballs over there. So it happens to be that it's this picture. So if I unclick this layer and I click it back on, all those go away. But let's say that I really want the star trails. I just wanna get rid of the light that went off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a mask. It's really simple. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on that layer and make sure that layer is highlighted. I'm gonna come right here and I'm gonna click on add a mask. Okay, so there's a rule in Photoshop when we work with brushes and the rule is basically uh, white reveals and black conceals. So I wanna have a black brush and all I have to do, so I'm gonna come over here to my brush tool. I wanna make sure I'm on normal and I have 100% capacity. And so I've got my black brush and all I have to do is make sure I have this mask clicked on, not the layer, but the mask. And then I just brush the foreground that I wanna get rid of. So that's all I gotta do to get rid of that light. All right. And then if I want to take all these layers and make a final top layer, maybe I wanna bring in a composite or bring in another sky with some color. I just click on and I have a Mac, so it's gonna be shift option command E, and it will make that one final layer. Um, if I wanna save this, for example, I can just flatten all these layers so I can go to image and then click, oops, sorry. I can go to layer and then click on flatten image. And this is where um, I can make it flatten and then go ahead and save it 
as a JPEG and go out from there. So basically that's a very, very simple way to explain how to stack in Photoshop. Um, when I do images um, that are three hours long, so if I'm doing a stack with like 300 photos or 400, um, I do, I, my computer cannot handle that with the megapixels that I have. And so I have to take all of those photos out in batches from Lightroom. So often I'll do that in stacks of 30. So um, if I'm working on a photo where I've got four hours of images, I usually have 20 stacks of like 30 and 40 images. And then I finally layer all those together in one final image. So Sam, that, yeah. Um, I think we have the answer, but let me ask the question. So if yeah. someone else is watching this on YouTube, it, you know, it, it can be answered. Um, Angie wanted to know, would that method work if an airplane flew through the sky and you wanted to get rid of it? Yeah, actually it would. Um, it's pretty easy to do. And the other thing you could do is you could take that particular image in Lightroom before you stack it and remove the airplanes. But um, you can use that method to remove the airplane lines um, once you have it stacked as well. Great. That's a good question. Okay, uh, let me show you guys how I would do star stacks. Um, so Photoshop can get very involved. Um, I prefer Photoshop because I usually do a whole lot more editing after I stack my photos. Um, so I tend to go to Photoshop quite a bit more than star stacks. But let me show you how I would do star stacks. So for Lightroom, what I'm gonna do is I've got this whole series of images. So instead of pulling them into um, Photoshop, I'm gonna go ahead and highlight them again. So I'm gonna click on my first image. All right, and then I'm gonna scroll all the way to the end, hold down my shift key, click on my last image. And then what I'm gonna do is I need to save all these photos in a file. So um, I'm gonna go to export. And like I said, you can save as a JPEG or you can save in raw. So star stacks will now work with raw. And so um, I usually put mine in a subfolder. I'll call it something that I'll know I can work with. And if I want to just look at a real quick JPEG to make it a lot quicker, sometimes I will go down and change to JPEG settings. But if I'm keeping it raw, I won't touch anything else because I want those raw photos to go to that same file. So I'm not gonna do this now because it might take a little bit of time, but what I'm gonna do is go ahead and open up Star Stacks and show, them, show you how to go from that file into Star Stacks. And see if this works. I'm basically selecting all of my pictures in my folder and I'm gonna drop them right here into Star Stacks. So you guys saw that, right? Yeah. So now they just literally all dropped in. So all I have to do is I'm gonna come over here to preferences and I talked about gap filling earlier. So I wanna make sure I go to blending mode and I wanna make sure that gap filling is selected. And this is where Star Stacks is gonna to try to do the best job it can to basically put um, th those gaps between all your star trails. It's gonna basically try to fill them a little bit. So for right now, I'm not gonna check anything else. I'm just gonna kind of go through the basics here. But I'm gonna come over here and you're gonna find this button that looks like a bunch of file folders stacked. Um, it says start processing. So I'm gonna go ahead and just click this. And this is the fun part. <laughs> it's kind of fun just to watch it work. So it'll stack them together. Okay, so let me ask you a quick question while it's doing that. Yeah. Uh, Valerie wanted to know, uh, for raw images to star stack starting in Lightroom, you're not doing any editing on the images first. Is that correct? Yeah. That's a great question. So sometimes I will do a little editing in Lightroom. Um, so I will play with exposure and I will play with temperature, but what I won't play with is I usually won't play with the lens correction setting or um, any of the settings that have to do with the lens. Because a lot of times if you stack those later, it causes what's called moray, which is kind of a Oh, it's a weird, funky looking thing that'll show up on your screen. So I try to deal with that later. But yeah, I will actually do basic global edits in Lightroom, and then I'll do more local edits after I stack them. So I basically clicked on that stack button. This is what we get. Um, and again, this doesn't look all that great because there's a lot of JPEG artifacts in here um, since this is a JPEG. And it was actually a pretty small file because I wanted it to not um, 
take my computer away. Uh, but essentially this is it. So if I wanted to like get a little bit closer, I can click the plus sign here. Um, I can click the minus sign to scroll out. Um, there are a couple other fun things. If I come over here to preferences, I can click like comment mode and I can run this again. So I'm gonna just basically come over here and click the stack again. And it kind of does that really fun little comment look. Um, some people like that. I'm not a huge fan, but it's fun to play with if you've gotten this for the first time. You can change um, the length of the comment mode, long trails versus short trails. And you can kind of get in here and play around with some of these options. But those are the basics to just getting star stacks to stack. So when I'm done with it, all I come over here is I click on the save. And when star stacks wants to save something, it'll immediately put star stacks in front of it. Um, so it, it, won't, it will retitle, which is a good thing. And then I'll go ahead and save it. And then I can actually pull that right back up into Lightroom and do some post-processing after star stacks is done or pull it into Photoshop to do more intense edits. So that's star stacks. Um, and, and that's really it. Um, unless anybody has any questions while I have these screens up. Is that a ta-da and you're done? Yeah, sorry, no, no big giant thing. Um, hopefully that was helpful to kind of get people started. I mean, I think star trails are like a lot of fun to do, but I think a lot of times when people are new to night photography, they're so enamored into capturing like all these other things, like the Milky Way that um, they forget to do star trails or it's hard to be patient when you're dead tired at the end of the night, you just wanna to go to sleep. So. I think if I can encourage people to set up your camera and let it run, that's when you can go to sleep and you can stack all those later. That's always fun to do. You know, I, I, I hate to admit this, but I kind of like star trails a little bit more than uh, the Milky Way. So oh. that's, I know that's, that's probably a terrible thing to say out loud, but I, I, I think it's the colors and the, the movement just it's I don't know it's just a little bit more appealing to my eye I know that the Milky Way is, is the thing that we you know all aim for but the star trails are just beautiful and unfortunately I don't have any good ones so I I need to get my tail end out there and, and try so um do you want to close with any final words, any tips that, uh, I mean, you've given us a lot of information. Is there a takeaway that you're like, oh, don't forget this. Just, you know, put it in your bag or something yeah. that you just want to close with. You know, um, there's just so much out there to learn from. Um, I don't profess to be an expert at all on star trails. I'm still learning a lot of stuff. But I think one of the things that's helped me um, is you know, find people that inspire you and that you like their work and then ask them lots of questions on how they did it. But I will also say that um, PhotoPills is the app that I use quite a bit. They have a whole free download on, um, I don't know what it's called, but it's, they have a bunch of downloads and books on how to do different things in the night sky, but, but they have one specific with Star Trails that's really helpful as well. Um, so PhotoPills and then just looking for the people that inspire you. I mean. I mentioned Lincoln Harrison and um, his work is just phenomenal. So um, if you have a chance, get out and check him out. But, um, but no, I mean, good luck and reach out to me for any questions. I'm happy to help anybody with any questions. Absolutely. There is one question that snuck in as we're closing. Uh, uh, Valerie wants to know, what about night filters for noise pollution? Do you ever use those? So I don't use any filters ever. Um, but I have friends that use them and I love their pictures. I just, I have so much stuff I carry all the time that I just kind of tend to think less is better sometimes. So it's not that I don't like them. Um, I just don't want to have to mess with them all the time. So I just don't. Um, but there are, I have some friends that use the, um, the sodium, you know, the light pollution filters and they absolutely love them. So um, I say go for it and, you know, experiment with those as well. Again, thank you for doing this. And, um, you know, this is, this is one of the things that I've always want to do with our presentations is kind of a, have a, here's an introduction of an idea and then have people come in and tell us how to do it and, and then kind of give you those examples. And it's just this, this is what I call a robust presentation. It's like, you know, there's inspiration here, there's technique and you know these these tools that you need to know and then you you have that flexibility of playing and being creative so i 
I particularly am excited to, to see this, this presentation. Um, so thanks again. So guys, you can connect Sherry through her website at bigbendnightphotography.com. And if you're on Instagram, look for her at Sherry uh, underscore Hunt. And Sherry is S-H-A-R-I underscore Hunt. And I wanted to invite you guys to check out the Happiness Hour community blog. And I wanted to take a minute to thank Elaine Pruden for helping me get it up and running. A new post went up earlier today called Wanderlust in Motion by Tricia Ziegler. So please check that out. And if you'd like to contribute an article, just take a look at the invitation on my website, lindanickel.com uh, for details. So for the last, I don't know, I don't think we've been doing it all 50 sessions, but I've been closing out each of the meetings by telling you to go out and create something beautiful. And last week I invited, I threw out an invitation to anybody that wanted to send in a photo and uh, for like a little show and tell and, and to show us their image and then tell us a little bit about their work. So there were four brave soldiers that uh, sent me images. So I'm going to uh, pop those up and then I'm gonna ask them to, to come in and um, talk about their uh, photographs. So pardon the clunkiness because I very rarely share my screen. So let's just see if I can get this up and running. So the first person um, that was, she's not brave, I just kind of decided she's going first, is Michelle Escloven. And you can find her at her website is michelleescloven.com. Well, the inspiration for this was the presentation from Sherry back last year or so. Um, I had tried a couple of times with, you know, night photography. And so her presentation really helped me out a lot. Um, the funny thing is she mentioned cars earlier today and the cross that's in this picture was actually highlighted from cars coming off the highway there on the beach road. Um, this cross was erected in um, 2007 after Hurricane Ike and has withstood all of the uh, hurricanes that we've had since then. And so it, it's always just something that I really like to photograph. It's great at sunrise. And one day I just thought, you know, I'd see what it would, if, you know, if the Milky Way would even show up down there at the beach. And so it did. So that was my inspiration behind the shot. Thank you, Michelle. And Sherry, I want you to know that we did not plan this. I had them send in uh, images and we threw it up and I thought, I wonder if this is a Sherry thing. So I, I'm tickled that, you know, I chose, well, this is our 50th session. So it kind of worked out that you were here. So I'm glad that you get to hear that in person. That's cool. Thank you so much. That's awesome, Michelle. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so the next one is going to be Mika Geiger. And you can find Mika at MikaGeiger.com. Um, Mika, do you want to tell us about your image? Yes. Well, people who know me will probably wonder if this is my photo because it's very unusual for me to have a photo that doesn't have an insect or a tiny critter. And that's one of the things that I have loved about happiness, our presentations. A lot of them have helped me hone my skills and other ones like this one tonight too, pointed me in a completely different direction, something I wouldn't have done before. And there are a number of actually presenters who came into my mind as I was photographing this. This was during that ice storm that we had recently in Texas that shut down um, the state for like six days. And I was stuck in the yard, no insects. So I focused on something completely different. And Alice Bender, she had a presentation on macro and she talked about an hour with the flower where you take you sort of like really focus on it and uh, see different angle and perspectives. And I spent more than an hour. I mean, over those six days, I spent like, I don't know how long, but it, the ice changed and it was just fascinating. And Valerie Hoffman, um, who, well, I've loved all of her presentations, but the one in Finding Abstracts, I think it was called in, in Nature, um, she got me thinking a lot more about 
curves and angles. And this to me, I, I titled this um, shark sighting in the agave ocean because uh, the red thorn, I guess you would call it, looks like a fin and the rest just looks like an ocean. Um, and I used actually a uh, close-up lens kit uh, that I learned about from Jose Madrigal during his incredible macro uh, presentation because I knew I could get the details that I wanted using that. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are so many others. I've been, I've learned something from everybody, even, well, John Fisher too, with the editing that I used in this to bring out the hues. Um, so yes, thank you to everybody for everything I've learned and having uh, great, I don't know, educational and social fun doing this. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, so I believe Julie is up. Is Hi. Julie Hi, Julie. Yeah. I, I usually don't take pictures like this. Usually um, I, I do like travel and landscape pictures. But anyways, this was inspired by uh, Carolyn Watson with her um, that class that she did, My Still Life Story. Right. And uh, to look at this, it looks so simple to do, but it, it took me an hour and a half <laughs> just <laughs> to arrange this and get the right angle. But um, I, I'm I think it came out cute. I think it's really cute. And I know that you'd said that this was, you know, you're, you're preparing for Easter. Yeah. And I thought, you know, when I saw you do this, I, I mean, when you sent the image, I, I immediately went, this is not what she normally does. <laughs> and that's what was so cool about you submitting that photo because, you know, we all kind of get in that, this is what I do and I don't really deviate. And whoever it is, whether it's um, Valerie or Carolyn or any of the other ones that you guys mentioned, it's just a little spark. Try something different. And, yeah. you know, if you hate it, delete it and no one has to know about it. But um, I, I, I was particularly excited to, to see this because it's, it's so different. It's, it's, and Carolyn kind of inspired me a little bit too, because yeah. I didn't really have an interest in still life. And um, Stephen Mack was here when he did that huge, just huge, elegant uh, floral uh, display. And then Carolyn came back and slapped on more ideas. And it, it's been kind of fun. I was at my mom's house this weekend and I'm looking around at her curios and I'm thinking, I'm gonna borrow some of this stuff at some point. But um, thank you for sharing, Julie. And Julie, it's Julie Chapa. And she's got her website is juliechapaphotography.com. And so the last one is um, with Karen Riley of homeplate101.com. And um, Karen, are you there? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, um, and this has actually been really amazing for me in a lot of ways. Um, I've tried to do something every week based on whatever the topic was. And so um, the one on the left, the green uh, flower is, it's not even a flower yet. So um, Val really like, one of the things that I've learned from her is to just look at things in a different way and take lots of pictures of the same things from different angles. And so the flower is not even blooming. I was waiting for this. I grew these, they're tiny miniature sunflowers and I grew them and then we were going on vacation and I knew I was going to miss the bloom. And I was like, I'm just taking a picture of it anyway. And um, it turned out to be one of the, one of my favorite pictures that I've taken. And, um, and also um, Michael Rung and John Fisher have made me look at um, kind of monochromatic in a different way and, and look for the highlights to make it more interesting in the patterns. And so, um, yeah, so that was why that one. And then Jose, when he was talking about all the in insects, I actually caught, this is, we were walking the dogs every day and my uh, neighbor had this beautiful, like all these sunflowers all over her yard. And so every day for probably a month, I shot those flowers while I was walking the dog. And finally, finally, I got a bee that was fairly in focus. And so I was pretty excited about that. But yeah, it's been great. Like I've, I love the still life. And I realized after listening to Carolyn that um, 
still life is probably what fits my lifestyle with, you know, trying to raise kids and have a job and, you know, um, you know, my husband and just with what's going on in my life right now, still life probably works well enough with macro that I can, those two things, because they're small and I can do them quickly and at home or near my home. Um, so yeah, it's been fantastic. I've learned a ton. I take notes every week and I always can pull out something that I can use. Thank you. I, I am so absolutely tickled. I don't know if that's the right word. I'm just kind of glowing because, you know, when I started this, I thought we're just going to blow through this for a couple of weeks and then we'll be back to real life. And all of a sudden I, we're looking at, for me, another two weeks, we're really into a full year of sitting at home and, you know, and just having these people come on and share what they know, it just kind of gets you a little, it makes you think creatively. And, and, and I've seen a lot of people's pictures. It's not just the, the four of you that shared, I've been watching and I, and I, and I look at what people are doing and it's, it's just, oh, I'm so excited. Right. Next week, Stephen Mack will be here to present the painterly photographic portrait. And so until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon. Cool.